welcome back. Uh, so far, we've seen the support vector machine algorithm uh, when you have linear separability and when you have perhaps linear separability in a higher dimension where you can use a kernel in the dual problem. What we finally said was one shortcoming uh, of the formulation that we have so far is the fact that it cannot handle outliers in a clean manner. This is because when you have outliers, using a kernel is not the best possible idea. So then the question is, how can we adapt or modify our formulation for support vector machine uh, to, to deal with outliers? So towards this, let's first start by uh, taking a look at the original formulation of the support vector machine, which is like this. Right. So this was the original formulation of the support vector machine where you wanted to find a W that minimizes the length squared or maximizes the width when you have when you fix the margin when you ground the margin to be one. So this was the original problem and now if you have a data set which is not linearly separable which has some outliers then this algorithm will not run because it is only looking for W's which have W transpose X I Y A is greater than or equal to one. You you need a W to to satisfy W transpose X I Y A greater than or equal to 1 for all data points, only then that W comes into play. And among those Ws that satisfy this, we are trying to fix the, pick the W that has the least length. So the problem is not all Ws are going to be feasible, right? So now somehow we have to fix this problem when you have outliers. And the way we are going to fix this is using the following idea, right? So this is the insight. Now, we are going to make every W feasible. Earlier, only Ws which correctly classified the separated the positives from the negatives were feasible. Now, we are going to make every W feasible. Now, how can we make that? How can we achieve uh, that objective of making every W feasible? Well, uh, the way we are going to do it is as follows, right? So, broad, I mean, intuitively, let's say we fix some W, fix any W. You know, W classifies some points correctly and misclassifies some points. Now, earlier, if a W misclassifies any point, then we will not allow the W, right? So, we won't take the W into consideration because you want the W to classify all points correctly. But such a W may not exist and that's why the problem comes. So now we are saying, well, take a W uh, and observe that this W classifies some points correctly and it misclassifies some other points. For the points it classifies correctly, there is no problem. For the points that are in misclassified or incorrectly classified, so you are going to do the following. The incorrect points, incorrectly classified points, uh, the idea is loosely speaking, right? So we'll say the incorrectly classified points can pay some bribe to become to go to the correct side, right? So to go to the correct side. So I have to quantify what these things mean. I'll do that. So somehow we are allowing the capability of points to pay bribe to make the W that we care about feasible. What does this mean? Right. So this means one way to achieve this is as follows, right? So what we are going to do is the following, right? So we are going to do a modified formulation, modified formulation, so you want to minimize over W, half norm W squared, nothing changes there so far, such that earlier you wanted W transpose Xi into Yi to be greater than or equal to 1. This is what you wanted for all i. Now, what I'm going to say is that, well, I fix a w. If the w satisfies this condition for a point x i y i, I'm happy. If it, if it does not satisfy this condition, now I'm going to allow this point to pay some bribe epsilon i such that this condition is satisfied. Now, why was that condition earlier not satisfied? Because w transpose x i y i was less than 1 but you want it to be greater than 1, which means that you need some extra push, right? So you need some extra num value to be added to this quantity to make it greater than or equal to 1. And that quantity is what I'm calling as bribe that the point I pays to satisfy this constraint. 
Now the break that each point pays is greater than or equal to zero, right? So you cannot pay a negative bribe. You are paying either a zero bribe. If the point is already classified correctly, I don't have to pay any bribe. Otherwise, I'll pay a zero. I'll, I'll, I'll pay a positive bribe to make this uh, equation satisfied. Um, now, I also have to decide how much bribe each point pays, right? So which means that I need to minimize this over the bribes epsilon i as well, right? So epsilon i is the bribe that the ith data point pays. Now, this might be a potential modified formulation. But now, uh, if you if you stare at this formulation for a second, you will realize there is something lacking about this formulation. Now, what is lacking here is the following. Now, if we solve this problem, what would happen is that our goal is to minimize the length of W. And now, I'm the moment I add these bribes, a possibility of uh, points giving bribes, now I am allowing every W to be feasible W, right? So earlier, only Ws which were classifying correctly, separating the point plus from the negative were feasible. Now all Ws are feasible. Now let's say I take <clears throat> the W, which is the W with all zeros, right? So that's also a W, valid W. Now is that a feasible W? Because all Ws are feasible, that will also be a feasible W. Why will that be a feasible W? Because you know, for the W, which is all zeros, this value is always going to be zero. But then each data point can pay a bribe of one to satisfy this equation. Now that bribe is of course greater than or equal to zero. So now you, you have all zeros, which is also a feasible W. And now you want to minimize the length over all feasible Ws, right? So that's what your, your goal is. But now you cannot minimize the length less than or equal to zero, <clears throat> which means that if I solve this problem, I'm just going to get all zeros as my solution. But then something really wrong is going on here, right? So what is going on wrong, right? So pause and think about this. I'll tell you what the answer is for this now. What is going on wrong here is the fact that it's not the fact that we allowed points to pay bribe, but, but what we did not do is that we did not penalize these bribes. Right? So we don't want points to pay bribes as much as possible, which means that if points are paying bribes, well, they better pay it with a cost, right? So it cannot come for free, right? So earlier, I mean, in this formulation that you're seeing right now, there is no you know, penalty for a point to pay bribe, right? So which means that if there is no I mean, restriction, everybody is going to pay bribe and then get their job done, right? So they'll satisfy that this equation, every point will do that. So which means that we have to penalize these bribes. We want to pay as less bribe as possible and still be able to satisfy this equation. How can we do that? Well, where, where can we penalize? We can only penalize in the objective, right? So because objective is where we want to, you know, determine how good a W is. Now, the moment I fix a W, the bribes are fixed, but then how much bribes should also be part of goodness of a W? So what we will do is that we will add the amount of bribe each data point pays as part of the objective itself. Now what would happen is that, you know, the, the vector W, which is all zeros, will have to pay a lot of bribe right? because each point will pay a bribe of one unit. And so the, the total bribe that, that is paid by the vector W equal to zero is N, right? So, and that might be too large. And so that may not be the optimal solution. Uh, now, one small thing to note here is that now we are, our objective has changed. Our objective is the sum of two terms. On the one side, we have half norm W square, which is the length of W. The other side, which, which we have sum over I, epsilon I, which is the amount of bribe that uh, each data point pays with respect to that W. Now these two are not necessarily compatible units, right? So one is in length, one is in, amount of bribe that I pay, right? So the units of these things are completely different. So we have to kind of balance these two different quantities carefully. And so we need a balancing factor here. And let's call that balancing factor C. Now, how important is this C? We don't know a priori, right? So it depends on the data, right? So how noisy is the data? How many outliers are there in the data will determine how much bribe is necessary and how the bribe and the length kind of kind of balance out each other, right? So now the C is some value which is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and this is typically a hyperparameter. Now we will 
you try different values of C and see which one works uh, in using cross validation. You've seen how cross validation works earlier. We'll use the same procedure to find out C. Right. So now this would be the modified formulation. Um, and this formulation is sometimes called as the, you know, uh, the soft margin formulation. Because we not only care about the margin via this length, we also care about, you know, the outliers. And so this is called as uh, the soft margin formulation. Now let's talk a little bit about the C. Right. So, so let's look at the case uh, when C equals 0. What happens when C is 0? Well, if C is 0, then what is C telling us? C is telling us how much one unit of bribe costs. Right. So that's what C says. Now, if C is 0, then it means that bribes don't cost. Which means what is the solution that we'll get? We'll get a W equal to 0 as the solution. This is the argument that we did earlier. Right? So if the bribes are not costly, you are just going to minimize the length and w equals 0 is a feasible point. So that will be the optimal one as well. On the other hand, if c is infinity, right? so if every unit of bribe is infinitely more important than the length, then what would happen? Well, the only way you can even get a feasible w is when you don't pay bribe at all. Right, so which means that it, there will, I mean, the only way this problem gets solved is if there is a W that actually classifies your data point correctly, which means that if C is infinity, we are back to our linear separability case. Right, so linear separability case, which means if there is no linear separable classifier, then all W's are equally bad, they are going to cost infinite. Right, so, so, so that's a useless setup. Right. So only if linearly separable, then you will get some non-trivial answer if C is infinity. So now the C itself is kind of interpolating between how important is the margin, which is via the length, versus how important are, are you trying to tackle the outliers. Because we don't know a priori how many outliers are there in our, in our data set, uh, the usual, usually what we do is to do cross validation for the C and then figure out, let the data figure out, tell us that what is the right right C here. Okay, so now this is our modified primal prop, uh, formulation. So this is soft margin primal formulation. It's called a soft margin again because we are, you know, we don't strictly ask for W transpose X A Y A to be greater than or equal to 1. We allow for the fact that some W's, you know, some uh, points may not necessarily satisfy this condition. Right? So the margin condition via this bribe. So this bribe I call this bribes, but then uh, in literature, this is called a slack variables. Uh, so this is these epsilon i's that we look at, looking at here are typically called as slack variables. Okay. So what we should do now is the following, right? So now we have a modified formulation, uh, which can potentially take care of outliers. But the earlier formulation that we had, had a great benefit when we looked at the dual problem, right? So the dual was kernelizable. The dual had simpler constraints, alpha greater than or equal to zero. But here we have completely modified the formulation. We have added this extra term psi i's, and then we are searching over w's and psi i's. And now it's not at all clear immediately, at least it's not obvious that you know how the dual problem is going to look like, right? So which means that we have to go through the process of converting this primal problem into a dual problem, and then see if we have lost our ability to kernelize, if we have lost our ability to you know have simpler constraints. If we have, then this is a bad formulation. If we have not, then this is a good formulation. At this point, we don't know. So the only way we can know is if we actually write out the dual formulation and find out. So let's go ahead and try and find that out. 